be in Joshua chapter 1, but I begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul writes here, I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud. That was the cloud that led the Israelites and actually shaded them during the day from the sun. And they all passed through the sea. That would be the Red Sea. God parted the Red Sea miraculously in their deliverance from Egypt. Egypt in the Bible is clearly representative of the world. So that speaks of our deliverance from the Lord and our journey, beginning of our journey of faith. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All that means is they recognized Moses was the leader and they were following the Lord by following Moses' directive. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. Jesus is the Christ in human form. But he's always been the Christ. And the Christ had no beginning and he has no end because he's God. And so Christ accompanied them. It was Christ, really. When Moses struck the rock, the rock was Christ and the water came out. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Over a 40 year period, most of those people never learned the lessons God was trying to teach them. What were the things that tripped them up? Well, they're just a summary listing. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. So for some of them, they didn't make it because their lifestyle was feeding their own cravings. It's called the flesh. It's called carnality. They never learned to deny the flesh and put God as number one. Their God was their stomach. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did in one day. 23,000 of them died. Our culture in the church How many have fallen? How many in a church service this morning? And even though you're in a church service, sexual sin in your life. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. Ah, terrible way to go. <laughs> Testing the Lord. They presumed that they could go ahead and God would still bless them even though their steps and their directives in life was not in the Lord's will and they just thought God would bless me anyway. That's testing the Lord. And do not grumble. Oh, you had to put that one in there, didn't you? <laughs> you know, that's a serious thing? Yeah, look. Don't know, grumble. As some of them did. And were killed by the destroying angel. Remember, a few weeks ago, we read Deuteronomy as God's leading them in the wilderness wandering. He led them, causing them to hunger. It was God's will at times that they hungered. And thirst. Legitimate issues and needs in life. And God orchestrated things so that they were in a place where they had to just trust God. But instead of trusting God, they complained. And we don't need to talk about the hurricane. Anybody still without power? God bless you. 
I won't ask you how you're complaining. It took me 24 hours to complain. <laughs> and isn't it crazy? No matter how many times you tell yourself the power's off, you still walk in the room and turn the switch on. <laughs> when you get a flashlight in one hand, you're turning the switch on the other hand. <laughs> it's the craziest thing. At least we had a generator. <laughs> Look, let's move on. Just move on. Man. I can hear you grumbling now. The grumbling has begun. <laughs> These things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. On whom the fulfillment of the ages is come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Joshua chapter 1, the whole book of Joshua in summary is now a new generation because that old generation, for the most part, they got tripped up along the way. They never learned the lessons, and so they never arrived at the place of abundance and blessing that God intended. Their marriages were never what God intended. Their families were never what God intended. Their lives were never what God intended. But it wasn't God's fault, it was their fault. And now we have a new generation. And now they're crossing the Jordan. The Red Sea was their salvation experience. Now it's the Jordan. And notice, we read it two weeks ago, but it's been two weeks. You've forgotten everything I said, and so have I. <laughs> After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, hey, Moses, my servant is dead. Now you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I'll give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Now one note two weeks ago that's worthy to remind ourselves of is in the sovereign plan of God, it's God's will that Moses is dead uh, because Moses could never lead us across the Jordan into the land of abundance. Why? Because Moses represents the law, Joshua chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. But grace and truth came by Christ Jesus. Joshua is the Old Testament name, Jesus. So now Joshua's on the scene because Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. This is the abundance. And Joshua is Jesus. Symbolically. Spiritually. Your territory, verse 4, will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you'll lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong, very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left. That you may be successful wherever you go. Don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. The Bible. So that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people. Go through the camp. Tell the people, get your supplies ready. Three days from now, you'll cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. The Lord your God has given you rest and has granted you this land. Your wives, your children, and your livestock may stay in that land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. But all your fighting men, fully armed, must cross over ahead of your brothers. You are to help your brothers until the, until the Lord gives them rest as he has done for you. And until they too have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. After that you may go back and occupy your own land which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise. Hebrews 3 and 4 weeks ago we mentioned it. Ten times God says rest. 
Rest, rest. And referring to the first generation that never learned the lessons God intended, they never entered God's rest. And so rest here speaks of faith and maturity. Not perfection, but faith and maturity. And we'll come back to that as God tells these tribes who have their rest and their inheritance to fight for their brothers. And then come back and settle them. We'll come back to that. Then they answered Joshua, whatever you've commanded, we'll do. Wherever you send us, we'll go. Just as we fully obey Moses, we'll fully obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey your words, whatever you command them will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Verses 6, 7, 9, and 18. God says be courageous. Be strong and courageous. Don't be discouraged. Don't be terrified. And one of the things... Well, the only thing we got to two weeks ago, out of three points in chapter one, we got to one. Be strong and courageous. And if you're going to inherit all that God has for you, if I'm going to inherit all that God has for me in this life, courage, strength. Now, remember... You're reading about a literal time and a literal historical uh, situation where literal Israelites took literal swords and marched against literal cities. That's not what we're called to do. It's symbolic, the historical record, but there are lessons for us. I read in Hebrews yesterday in my devotional reading, talking about, again, not giving up your confidence, the context of courage, perseverance. So that you might inherit God, what God has promised you. So that your marriage might be all God intends. So that your life might be that all God intends. And it's there for everybody to be blessed. Doesn't mean you'll be without struggle. Doesn't mean prosperity kind of stuff either. Doesn't mean that God doesn't bless us physically and spirit, I mean spiritually as well as spiritually. But there are some situations in the Bible you can't apply a Joel Osteen message to. <coughs> Your best life now. Yeah, read the last part of Hebrews 11. What about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute? Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are you when men insult you and hate you and say all manner of evil against you. Blessed are you. Stephen, they're stoning him. But they could not stand up against the wisdom by which he spoke. Amen. And they could not rob him of the joy that they saw on his face. And in his dying breath, Father, forgive them. Don't hold his charge against them. Sounded like Jesus. It was Jesus. Living through Stephen. Something the world can't rob us of. But it will take courage. Courage. To be the student at the university before the professor that tries to tell you you came from a monkey. <laughs> and, and you don't want to be arrogant, rude, but, but you don't want to compromise truth. But take courage. Hey, let me tell you something. It's going to take courage if you're going to lead your family spiritually. Take courage to take that step. Be strong. Courageous. Now, we hit that two weeks ago. Be strong. Courageous. Let me just say one more thing, and then we'll go to point two. There are going to be times when the strength you need will be supernatural. Plenty of verses, I got some in my notes, plenty of verses, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Jude, verse 20, that little New Testament book, Jude. Build yourselves up. Just as I exercise physically, because I like physical health, more importantly, I exercise spiritually. And it takes discipline to do it. 
And you're going to stay healthy spiritually. you got to exercise spiritually. But no matter how faithful you are in spiritual exercise, there will come those times in your life as a Christian when no amount of anything we can do will suffice. And you will be without strength. And it will take something supernatural. But if you haven't been doing the spiritual exercises, those times are much, much more difficult. I thought of David, and we won't turn to it, but in 1 Samuel chapter 30, David, the man after God's own heart, but a man who also made some very bad mistakes in life. As he's running from King Saul and he's out in the wilderness and taking refuge, people who were discontent and dead and in all kind of trouble, they came and they gathered around David. They became his, some of them his mighty men. That's such a cool story. And as a man, I like that story. <laughs> but even then, in the will of God, Running from Saul, David at times got out of the world. Asha, Asha is uh, an enemy king. David is um, taking up residence with Asha. And Asha begins to trust David. Good man, he's, he's, he's deserted Israel and he's on our side. So much so that David says, hey, you let me go and fight with you, and you know, I'll show you what I can do. And Asia says, says, sure, let's do it. But on the way to the battle, to, to fight against fellow Israelites, here's David and his, his mighty men. And Asia, his military commanders began to talk on the way to the battle. Hey, this is David. He's the one they sing about. You know, Saul is slain his thousands, David is tens of thousands. He's a mighty warrior. And what he's planning, this is what they say to the king. What he's planning is once we get into the battle, he and his men are going to turn against us, and then he'll be in good standing with Israel again. And the king of Israel again, because he's going to turn against us. And they say, You tell him and his men, they can't go with us. They're not going to fight with us. Now, what a, what a gracious God. To sovereignly protect David and his men from fighting against their fellow Israelites. Because Asius, even though he trusts David, he has to listen to these commanders and he tells David, they, they don't trust you, you got to go back home. David goes back home. Well, home for him at that time is a place called Ziklag. And that's where he left his family and all the other guys, they left their families, their kids, their wives. And boy, are they in for a surprise. And they get back to Ziklag and the Amalekites have raided Ziklag. And they burned them. And they didn't kill any of the women and children. They took them captive. And the Bible says there in that story, and I was reading it just the other day, just the other week. And boy, did I need it. And it says when he came back, can you imagine going back? You're going back. And your, your family has been kidnapped. And every one of these guys' families have been kidnapped. And here's what the Bible says. David and his men wept until they had no more strength. No more strength. And you'll come to those times, and I'm emphasizing this point, we'll get to the next point, and hopefully we we'll have God feel like the Lord may be just <coughs> pausing me on this. But somebody needs to hear it. I needed to hear it when I heard it. And not only that, I mean, you're so distraught and you're so discouraged and you wept because your family's been kidnapped. So you can't weep anymore. And it says they were without strength. And then David's men, because they began to talk and think, you know what it got us in on. And they're talking of stoning him. And he hears about it. He hears they're talking of stoning him. And here's what he says. David found strength in the Lord his God. And there's going to be times it's going to be supernatural. And it's only going to be the Lord. Paul wrote in 
Corinthians, you know what happened to us in Asia, in the provinces, things we were going through far beyond our ability to endure. Let me read your story. I think you'll like it. If you're asleep, you'll wake up. That's a good story. <laughs> Somebody sleep beside you, wake them up. This is a good story. Black on Air Force Base, Texas. I remember the first scar I ever got. It was actually two scars. I was six years old, teaching my little buddy next door how to golf. I take my dad's golf bags, bag of golf clubs, and dragged it out of the yard. I wanted to show my friend how to hit the ball, so I stood behind him, had him choke up on the nine iron. I was all gung ho to be a teacher. I coached him on the backswing and then the follow through. And then he wailed back and hit me in the head. <laughs> the nine iron took a chunk out of the back right corner of my scalp, and on the follow through, hit me on the other side. I had two giant flaps of skin peeled off my skull. The blood just starts pouring down. I put my hands up. I feel the soft, wet part, then the little bristly, hairy part. I push my scalp back and went running into my house. I'll never forget the look on my mother's face. She's in the kitchen with her cat's eye glasses talking on one of those black rotary dial phones. She just let go of the phone. I had blood running down my arms all over my little white t-shirt. She made this dying pigeon noise and called my dad. Told him to meet us in the emergency room. We pulled up in the ER at Lackland Air Force Base. My dad was a drill sergeant. Rolled up sleeve, the tan uniform, the smoky, the bare hat. His job all day long was to yell at guys, tell them that they were no good, and that his grandmother could do everything they could do but better. <laughs> he comes in and he says, where's my son? And there I am on the table, drenched in blood. The doctor says, we got to shave a little bit here, and then we're going to stitch him up. My dad's there, he's holding my foot, he's looking at me. He's like, are you okay? But I heard, are you okay? <laughs> so I was like, yes, sir, I'm okay, no problem. The doctor tells my dad, stay here, I gotta go get the needle. My dad looks at me and then his eyes roll back in his head. <laughs> and he drops. <laughs> I think he's trying to make me laugh. Trying to give me a little encouragement. I'm laughing. But on the way down, my father hit his head on the end of that metal table so bad it caught his eye socket and ripped. Oh. I'm lying on the table saying, Dad, that's funny. Oh, where are you? And then the surgeon comes in and he's like, what the? My dad was unconscious in a giant pool of blood. His uniform completely drenched. The doctor lowers the table. We get my dad on the thing. He's stitching my dad up, and I'm watching and helping. And my dad is out cold. He gets 16 stitches from the corner of his eye all the way back up. Then the surgeon says, help me put your dad in the wheelchair. <laughs> and then the surgeon stitches up my superficial scalp wounds. Once I'm all stitched up, he wraps my whole head. I've got a Q-tip looking head with blood spots soaking through. My dad's still out cold, and the surgeon goes, just push him out to your mom, okay? <laughs> and my mother is in the waiting room. I come out pushing my father in the wheelchair, but I'm not very tall. So I'm kind of looking over the side. I'll never forget the look on my mother's face. Thank God she was sitting down when she fainted. <laughs> No matter how tough you are, even for the Lord, there are going to be times you're going to need His help like never before. Courage, strength. The second point I don't need to dwell on because if you've been in any kind of Bible teaching church, if I've been your pastor for any length of time at all, 
You know the second point. The only question is, are you doing it? And it's Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. And that saturates your life with the Word of God. Amen. And if you're not saturating your life with the Word of God, you're never going to get all that God wants for you in life. Now, I'm only going to say the point because, look, if you're not doing that, there's nothing I can do. I can't preach it to you. You already know. Now you just need to do it. And the third and last point, number one, be strong and courageous. Number two, saturate your life with the Word of God. And number three, help your brothers. And the message is very clear to me. Because rest speaks of faith. And I don't think it's wrong to suggest it speaks of maturity. Not perfection. Perfection is called heaven. Help your brothers. And ladies, I make no apology. The last 12, 13, whatever minutes I got left, I want to talk to men. Because God created man for Men and women are equal in terms of creation, but God calls the man to lead. Amen. God calls the man to lead in the home. God calls the man to lead in the church. And so I call to you men. Help me, brothers. One of the goals I have in this last stretch of my ministry, however long it lasts, Look, I'm asking God to give me 25 years. I'm, I'm never, that retirement thing was such a mistake. I never wanted to retire. We won't go back. We're not going back. We won't even talk about it. What? What are you talking about? Help your brothers. So many stories. Oh, I don't even have time. So many stories. I, I'm reading last week, uh, one of the days of devotional time in the Old Testament, Second Chronicles chapter 32, and enemy coming against Israel as they have many, many times. And King Hezekiah, he got up and just what he said, just what he said, encouraged the people. Sometimes it's only something you say. One of the goals I have, I, I really want to work hard at creating an environment for us as a church fellowship where if you don't want to be, you don't have to be just a number. If you want to be a number, and you just want to come to church and do the church thing, come do the church thing. But you know that's not God's plan. That's why verses like Hebrews says, encourage, encourage one another daily. Ecclesiastes 4.12, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily, not quickly. Now, we want to have it for men and women, but I'm, I want to address the men. October the 7th. Don't have your wife write it down. You write it down. <laughs> October the 7th. 7.30 a.m. And I realize not, it's not going to fit everybody's schedule, but our goal is we will work toward fitting everybody's schedule. October the 7th. What's October the 7th? That's the launching of our men's ministry here at Calvary Chapel and Fellowship. <clears throat> 7.30 breakfast. Here's the deal I'm making you. The breakfast cost us $10 for a caterer to come, to come and do it. $10 per head. We're only going to charge you six. And the offerings of the Lord's people is going to subsidize the rest. Okay? Six bucks. I want to try to make it as easy as possible for you to be there. Don't say, I couldn't afford $10. Well, can you afford six? If you can't afford six, 
steal two from your mom and then ask forgiveness. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Ask somebody the moment. October the 7th, 7.30 a.m. Right here. Right here. First thing is, next week, we'll tell you how you can sign up. We'll have online sign-ups. We'll have live sign-ups. There'll be no excuse to sign up. Six bucks for October the 7th, men's breakfast. I realize you can't make, some people can't make this up. Then we'll let you know what's happening. Because beginning on the 7th and that week, I already got some guys in mind to lead a small group. And we're having free enterprise small groups. All I mean is, some may meet at Panera Bread, some may meet at Starbucks, some may meet here at the church. We may have a big group that meets here at the church once a week and then break up into small groups. We're going to try to do everything we can that everybody that wants to be, starting with the men, if you don't want to be just a number, you don't have to be. And we need one another, whether you realize it or not. Yeah. We need one another. So sign up beginning next Sunday for October the 7th, men's breakfast. Second, buy the book All In by Mark Batterson. All In by Mark Batterson. It's a great book. I think it's a great one to start off because it talks about being all in for Jesus. It's a great challenge. And don't let somebody else, look, don't turn to your wife and say, could you get that book for me? You get the book. You go on Amazon, it's a paperback for like $8.03. It's hardback for like 12 bucks, and it's on Kindle for like 9 bucks. Get the book, because beginning October the 7th, we're going to read one chapter a week. If you can't read one chapter a week, you're a sissy. And I said it. I said it twice. First service had was. And once a week, the goal is that we are going to develop relationships, the kind of relationship that we can encourage one another, encourage in the faith. We need one another. And the goal down the road is all kinds of small groups, men, women, life groups, all kinds of meetings. But you've got to give us time. We don't even have a staff. We'll get there. The Lord's going to help us get there. We'll get there. What you experienced, if you five in your pastor at the other church, that was 34 years of culmination and, and bringing to that point. That's 34 years. Come on, now we're relaunching. Amen. Amen. But we'll get there. And we're starting with the men. So I've laid it down. Since it's gone. October the 7th, 7.30, men's breakfast. In the I call it the cafe, the fellowship hall, but I pray we got to move it in here. I pray there's not enough room in there. For the breakfast. Six bucks a head. Cost is ten, but charge you six. What a deal. <laughs> Get the book by October the 7th. Why am I repeating myself? Because I'm talking to men. <laughs> I mean, I look like a teenager, but I can act like one, so come on. What was that baby doing? October the 7th. 7.30 a.m. Between now and then, get the book, All In, by Mark Batterson. And then we'll begin to tell you how to sign up. We're going online and live beginning next Sunday.